Hi there everyone, welcome to our lecture on blood and tissue protozoans part 1. For this part, we shall be dealing with the, the tissue protozoans. Okay, so let's talk about the flagellates first. Um, flagellates are actually divided into two types. So the first type of flagellates, we call them the, the atrial flagellates. So when we say atrial flagellates, we are, refer we are referring to lumen dwelling. So in fact, we have already discussed this atrial flagellates from the previous lecture. So to give you the review, an example of the atrial flagellate was Giardia lamblia. Okay, so another part of flagellates are the blood and tissue flagellates. So in fact, some of the blood flagellates, we call them the hemoflagellates. Okay, hemoflagellates, which means that um, um, they are this, uh, they, they actually occupy the lumen of the blood vessel. Okay, so we have the uh, different genera under the blood and tissue flagellates. Okay, so first we have the genus Leishmania. So, genus Leishmania is an example of parasite with mammalian and an insect host. So, actually, there are several stages of development of this particular flagellate. So, the first stage is called Leishmania. Okay, so Leishmania is also known as Amastigos. Okay, always remember that um, most of the medical terms, when you put the prefix a in front, it means absence of. So, when you say a mastigode, it means that it is a stage of hemoflagellate development wherein flagellum is not yet developed. So, when you say a mastigode, there is no flagellum yet, but it has nucleus and kinetoplast. So, this particular type of flagellate lives um, intracellularly um, it is oval in shape between two to three microns okay the second one is the leptomonas okay so this is the one this is this is also known as the pro mastigote so majority of pro mastigote occurs in vectors or in intermediate hosts such as the fly okay so it is elongated, measuring around 15 microns, and it has a flagellum at the anterior end, but there is no undulating membrane yet. Okay, so flagellum starts to develop here in promastigote stage. So as you can see, um, this is the amastigote. A mastigote doesn't have flagella, but it has both the nucleus and kinetoplast. And then this is the promastigote. Promastigote has a nucleus and the kinetoplast is at the anterior portion. Okay. And there's already a flagellum, a single flagellum that is more or less with, uh, around 15 microns in length. And promastigotes are found in vectors such as in the insect vector. Um, because of the presence of flagellum, Promastigote is said to be motile and it is found at the mid gap. Okay, mid gap. Okay, unlike a mastigote, a mastigote is found intracellularly inside the host, inside the host, human host or mammalian host. Okay, so promastigote, therefore, um, um, maybe, uh, of course, can be seen if you're if you will be dissecting the vector that. That, that has been infested or infected with promastigote and these are the things that we'll be able to see. So single flagellum and then here's the kinetoplast and then the nucleus is found somewhere here. Okay, so a mastigote on the other hand is found whenever tissue biopsy is submitted for examination. So this is an example of a mastigote of Leishmania donovani. Okay. So the specimen that was submitted in the laboratory was a spleen. So the individual amastigote measures around 1 microns in diameter. So this is an example of amastigote. So here's another example of amastigote. So they are intracellular and they do not have flagella yet. Okay. 
So, here's an example, another example of a mastigote of Leishmania. Okay, so this time, um, it is found in another mammalian host, which is a dog. So, inside the macrophage, inside the macrophage. So, this is the um, macrophage. Um, macrophage is a mature WBC, and you'll be able to see a mastigote inside. A macrophage filled with Leishmania amastigotes. A macrophage filled with Leishmania amastigotes. Okay, so what are the different um, what are the different um, species of Leishmania? So we have here um, the table that will differentiate them according to species, habitat, mode of transmission, the vector, and the pathogenesis or the clinical presentations. So I hope it's okay to cover this one. Okay, so first we have Leishmania donovani. So this this particular parasite will inhabit inhabit our visceral organs, particularly our liver, spleen, lymph nodes, and bone marrow. Now take note that the mode of transmission for all the Leishmania species that we will be discussing here in this slide uh, may be transmitted through skin inoculation, which means that um, they were uh, we, we, um, the humans are actually bitten by the sunfly or the phlebotomus fly. So, Leishmania donovani will cause the so-called visceral leishmaniasis and it is otherwise known as the Kala Azar fever that I really have to say to the feeling dum dum fever, black disease or death fever. Leishmania tropica will infect the lymphoid tissues on the skin okay so it will cause cutaneous leishmaniasis or the oriental sore or the aleppo fever baghdad boil or delhi ulcer and leishmania brasiliense um, will infect the mucous membrane of the nose mouth ear larynx and pharynx so take note that for the first two leishmania the the vector are is actually Phlebotomus papatachi or papataki, while for Lismania brasiliense, it is Phlebotomus intermedius. So, since brasiliense occupies the mucous membrane, okay, so and and also the skin, it is known as the mucocutaneous leishmaniasis or the American leishmaniasis or spondia or chicleros ulcer, okay. And these are the other species of Leishmania of both uh, of of different um, species. So Leishmania tropo tropica, which is by the way endemic in Middle East, such as in Saudi Arabia, and Leishmania major Ethiop Ethiopica, because this was first isolated in Ethiopia. Leishmania mexicana, so they will cause cutaneous Leishmaniasis. Uh, we have already discussed Brasiliensis and Donovani. Leishmania infantum and Chagasi. So these are the other causative agent of visceral Leishmaniasis. So, so Leishmania Donovani is also known as Kala Azar fever. So obviously there's a fever. And it is characterized by double spiking cues. Meaning to say, um, there's a chance that fe fever increases. And then it will go down, the temperature will go down, and there's another spike or rise in temperature uh, on a daily basis. So there would be enlargement of spleens and liver. I'm sorry for that typographical error in this slide. Um, progressive anemia, dusky color, and earth gray color of the skin. Now, for the Leishmania tropica, so you can just imagine that there would be ulcers, self healing, pain, painless ulceration lesion. However, um, if there is an advantage of having uh, not really advantage, but the good thing about it is that infection leaves permanent immunity, meaning you'll not be infected with Leishmania tropica species again. Leishmania brasiliense um, will cause mucocutaneous leishmaniasis characterized by mucosal ulceration. Uh, it, it will cause disfigurement in your nose, so that's why it is called the tapir nose. <laughs> Okay. So, for the life cycle, as you can see, uh, in order for you to be infected with Leishmania, um, you have uh, the, the host is usually being beaten by the sunfly. So, what will happen here is that 
the sunfly will whenever that sunfly uh, beats you okay uh, or bites you okay um, it will inject promastigote so promastigote therefore is the infected stage so eventually promastigotes will be phagocytized by macrophages or by monocytes so from promastigote it becomes a mastigote so a mastigote is diagnostic stage because you don't usually catch sunfly to diagnose it okay so we usually submit tissue biopsy for the diagnosis of leishmania so a mastigote has this capability to multiply inside the cell that's why they are called intracellular and whenever the cell bursts this amastigote will now infect other cells. So the same humans who got infected will be beaten again by the by sunfly. So what are the chances? Well, if the sunfly is endemic on that area, then we could expect that leishmaniasis may also be endemic. So sunfly will take a blood meal and eventually it will ingest macrophages that has been that have been infected with the amastigote. So the ingestion of parasitized cell will allow transformation from a mastigote. It becomes promastigote. So a mastigote transform it into a mastigote in the gut, meaning while in the mid gut or while they are inside the intestine of the sunfly. Okay. So from the intestine or the mid gut, they don't usually have intestine. We call it mid gut in, in cases of sunfly. Um, from the intestine they will actually go to the proboscis sa tuka, and then ready to infect another human okay so that is the that is the um, life cycle of leishmania okay so these are the appearance of the vectors so you can see that um, we call them the phlebotomous flies phlebotomin okay and the females are called hematophagus which means that females are the one that that is infectious because they are the ones that sucks blood from humans okay while males are are not really considered as as vector because males are sub feeders meaning sa mga kamog lang sila nabubuhay batang kamog okay so the initial infection um they are all similar in all species uh, as you can see the mode of transmission is inoculation of promastigote. Um, this will result in inflammation and chemotaxis because this is the natural response of our immune system. Naturally, um, our macrophages will in will actually um, ingest the promastigote. So, from promastig promastigote, it becomes a mastigote inside. I'm sorry again for the typo. It becomes a mastigote inside the macrophages. So, inside the macrophage, it will lyse, the parasite will be released, it will spread to our lymphatic system, to the circulatory system, and eventually go to, uh, to the target organs. Well, it depends on the species. So, let's say, for example, it's Leishmania donovani. If it is Leishmania donovani, then it will go to the visceral organs. Leishmania tropica, for example, will go to, our, to the skin. Leishmania brasiliense will, will go to the nose, for example. So it depends on the target organ, depends on the species of the Leishmania. So the clinical disease, therefore, uh, may be divided into two types. Um, you do not want to have a visceral disease because it infects internal organs. 90% fatality if it is left untreated. And these are vital organs of our body because this could include liver, spleen, bone marrow. Unlike if it's cutaneous, it is generally self-healing, especially if it's just the skin or the mucous membrane. However, the problem is this will result into disfigurement. So, so, so that's why they call it the tapir nose. Okay? So, um, Leishmania, then uh, Donovani or the visceral Leishmaniasis, was discovered as early as 1903 by William Lishman. So, in 1920, antimony, which is of course a type of metal, was used. The pentavalent antimony was used for its treatment. So, 
in 1931, there was, uh, they experimented on the transmission of visceral leishmaniasis. So they are, they've discovered other species aside from Donovani, so such as Archibaldi Chagashi in Infantum. So they are, the, uh, that it depends on the geographical distribution and the disease is generally called Kala Azar disease. So Infantum mainly affects children, while well, Donovani mainly infects adults. So the visceral leishmaniasis has an incubation period that may vary between 3 up to 100 weeks. So that's a very wide incubation period. So it's usually characterized by the presence of low-grade fever and then suddenly you'd notice that your liver, your spleen will enlarge and then there would be hyperplasia of the bone marrow. So since bone marrow is affected, there is anemia, meaning red cells production drop, leukopenia, WBC's production drop, then there would be cachexia, and then antibodies would eventually um, um, rise up to the occasion. So there would be hypergamma globulinemia, which is characterized also by epistaxis or bleeding of the nose. Okay, And then proteinuria, the presence of protein in the urine, hematuria, the presence of blood in the urine. Fortunately, um, uh, treatment is actually possible. Um, good nursing means that there should be a supportive treatment, diet, antibiotics, um, pentavalent antimony, and pentamidine was actually used for treatment. And for control, uh, we can control it by controlling the vector and the reservoir. And then we have to treat active cases. And for some country where leishmaniasis or visceral leishmaniasis is endemic, a vaccination program is available. So let's talk about let's talk about the diagnosis for our visceral leishmaniasis. So um, the first method is the parasitological diagnosis, which means that we want to look for the presence of MST goat from the various um, specimen. Um, that will be submitted in the laboratory. So it could be a lymph node. So it, if it's a lymph node, usually um, they have they we have what you call the um, FNAB or the fine needle aspirate biopsy. So in, they use a very long needle and then puncture it into the lymph node, and then hopefully they will be able to aspirate a mastoid. Tissue biopsy such as the liver and spleen or spleen aspirate or bone marrow aspirate may also be possible, and then we stain it. And then we look it. We look under the microscope. So what are we looking for? We're, uh, I think I've shown you the picture a while ago. We're looking for the presence of a mastigoid. So sometimes um, we're using um, NNN medium. Okay. So we usually um, use NNN medium if we want to. Sometimes when we look under the microscope and there's not enough a mastigoid from the aspirates or biopsies that were submitted. So in the laboratory, we can grow them or in, in vitro. We call it the NNN medium. Um, it is called NNN because it's NOVI, N-O-V-Y, V-Y, di ko alam mag symbol. And then the, the second N refers to MacNeil. So MacNeil is spelled as M-A-C-N-E-A-L. And then the last is Nicole, N-I-C-O-L-L-E. So NOVI. McNeil nickel medium. So it's a simple mixture of 0.6% sodium chloride and then you add it to blood agar plate or blood agar so that you'll be able to make a slant or a slope. So that will allow um, the laboratory to go uh, to grow a massive goat uh, in the future. And then of course um, uh, direct agglutination test, ELISA, in immunofluorescent antibody testing, these are all examples of immunologic diagnosis. So when I say immunologic diagnosis, um, we're trying to determine if antibodies are actually found in the immune system. So it is useful, especially at the latter part of the infection. So skin test is also available, Leishmanin, Leishmanin test, we call it Leishmanin test, um, usually being used for to survey the population and follow up after treatment. So there's also a non-specific detection of Hyperglobulinemia, yours again, sorry for spelling. Um, Hypergamma globulinemia refers to the increase in gamma globulin. Okay. 
okay? Or by electrophoresis. So, wow. This one is an example of the bone marrow aspirate. Um, if you'll be watching the procedure on the YouTube, in YouTube, um, usually, um, uh, it's, it's painful to look at, especially um, if we're going, the, the, the needle is actually this, okay, the length. And, yeah, you may want to watch the YouTube. Okay, the, the procedure for bone marrow aspirate biopsy so that you'll appreciate the specimen whenever you receive it to the laboratory you'll 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 notice how difficult it is to collect such kind of specimen and here's how the bone marrow amasigote would look like under the microscope so this is an example of a macrophage and then you'll see several amasigotes inside the cell again intracellular so here's an example of a man whose liver and spleen are enlarged because of Leishmania donovan. Another profile view of a teenage boy suffering from visceral leishmaniasis. So you notice that the boy exhibits splenomegaly, the ab abdomen is distended, and there is a severe muscle wasting. So wow, here's another example of a 12-year-old boy suffering from visceral leishmaniasis. So the boy exhibits, again, enlargement of the spleen and li spleen, splenomegaly and severe muscle wasting. And of course, um, since liver is, in, is affected, um, you'd notice that patients, um, this, this is a colored or a, an Afro-American or a, 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 a black, or black uh, from, from black origin, Okay, for, uh, for, uh, not sure if it's from America or in, 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 in South America, but you'd notice that the skin is uh, yellowish because it's jaundice. Jaundice is the yellowish discoloration of the skin. Um, for uh, in people from, the, from their country, it's kind of difficult to notice it. So that's why you have to look at the palm. Okay, so you'll notice that there is a yellow discoloration of the skin. So there is also an enlarged spleen and liver in an autopsy of an infant. Wow, this comes from infant dying who, who had just died from visceral leishmaniasis. From an infant with this, with the liver this big, it is indeed considered as hepatomegaly. Now, let's. There is also a post calazar dermal. Lishmanoid. So what does it mean? When you say post, it means that these patients had visceral leishmaniasis before and it normally develops in less than a year after you have recovered from, from um, visceral leishmaniasis. Um, it is an example of recrudescence. What, what do you mean by recrudescence? So when you say recrudescence, it also happens in malaria. So so when you say recrudescence, it means that um, recrudescence means that you are not able to completely eliminate the parasite. In this case, you are not able to completely eliminate um, the amasigote. Maybe um, the, they have this some kind of mechanism to fool your immune system. They were just hiding or inactive somewhere in the spleen, in the liver or the treatment may not be complete so that's also a possibility and it is the the, the post kala azar derma leishmanoid is restricted to the skin it is rare but and it also varies geographically so an infection with visceral leishmaniasis a subclinical or in apparent infection what does it mean it means that um the patients are asymptomatic it might either lead to recovery so in you mean recovery means that you're immune to infection or death because of the possibility of concurrent infection which means that you have other underlying infection hey so let's talk about um cutaneous leishmaniasis um there are several clinical types of cutaneous leishmaniasis so we have the Leishmania major. So it is a zoonotic cutaneous Leishmaniasis that can be diagnosed through at lesions 
with severe reactions. Leishmania tropica, um, antrophonotic cutaneous leishmaniasis. This one naman is an example of dry lesions with minimal ulceration. So it is known as the oriental sore, which is the most common. And the good thing about it, I mean, it's a lesser evil because uh, the ulcer is self-limited. That's why it's called dry lesion with minimal ulceration. So to diagnose this, uh, we have to look for the so-called gym sustain. So that we have to look for the LD bodies. LD bodies are basically amastigotes. Okay. So biopsy, um, that, so that you'll be able to look for the LD bodies or you may want to place the specimen or the tissue in NNN medium so that you'll be able to cultivate the pro -masticals. The uncommon type is the so-called DCL or the diffuse cutaneous leishmaniasis. Um, one of the species is called Ethiopica, which is diffuse non-nodular, non-ulcerating lesions. Um, it will produce low immunity to leishmania antigens, but there are numerous parasites. Also, parasitemia is possibly a possibility. So, parasitemia, by the way, is the presence of parasites in the blood. And then we also have here Leishmaniasis residiva. Um, this one is called Lupoid Leishmaniasis. Um, there would be several immunological reactions to Leishmania antigen leading to persistent dry skin, but there are few parasites. Choose your poison. So this is an example of the NMN medium, the Novi McNeil Nicole medium. Simply, 0.6% sodium, uh, sodium chloride added to blood agar. Wow, this is the ulceration in Leishmania tropica, and you can see here a mastigotes. And then we also have here diffuse cut ah, cutaneous Leishmaniasis affecting the nose, the residiva. And then here's another example of cutaneous Leishmaniasis of the face. Okay, cutaneous Leishmaniasis of the arm, the face. And this one, uh, it's kind of sad to have this mucocutaneous leishmaniasis. The mucous membrane and the nose resulting in the so-called tapir nose. So for the lab diagnosis, again, we've been saying that the diagnostic stage is a mastigote which can be recovered from tissue biopsy if it's leishmania brasiliense, skin biopsy if it's leishmania tropica, so bone marrow, spleen, lymph node aspirates for Leishmania donovani. Serologic tests are diagnostic. Are, these are not diagnostic though may be employed for various reasons such as complement fixation tests, immunofluorescent antibody tests, counter-tolerant, electrophoresis, then culture using the NNN medium, Montenegro intradermal test for cutaneous and mucocutaneous leishmaniasis, the, the principle of the intradermal test is the delayed type hypersensitivity reaction. Okay, so non specific tests for IgM like the Pierce test and the Chopra test. Okay, so other mode of transmission which may not be as popular as the phlebotomous bite. Okay, this includes blood transmission, which means that if the country is endemic for this particular disease, then they have to screen blood for, for this leishmania. Transplacental transfer, bite wounds, and direct treatment. Um, there's a treatment um, for self-healing lesions. It's good. No treatment. Of, uh, you don't have to treat it. But for for medical treatment, you may want to have a combination of antimony. The pentavalent that antimony goes by the name of pentostam, amphotericin B. And whenever there is a bacterial infection, then antibiotics may also be possible. And for those lesions, for those ulceration, cryosurgery, excision, and curatage may be, uh, may be um, done. Okay? To speciate or to identify the species because it's kind of difficult to determine which species are we looking for because all, you all you'll see in in the in the tissue biopsies are amasicles so you may want to look for zymodines it's an example of isoenzymes 
usually found in protozoans, monoclonal antibodies, and PCR through DNA hybridization. Okay? As um, Leishmania, so the next species or the death, the next genus that we shall that we will be discussing is the so-called Trypanosoma. So what's the difference between Leishmania and Trypanosoma? So unlike Leishmania, um, Trypanosoma is considered to be as an extracellular parasite. So when you say extracellular parasite, it is not found inside the cell. So unlike a mastigote, for Leishmania, you'd notice that most most of them are a mastigote. Okay, the diagnostic stage in humans are a mastigote, which means that they are found inside they're found inside the spleen, they're found inside the cells, the spleen, liver, unlike trypanosoma. However, the common denominator between the common denominator between um, Leishmania and trypanosoma is that both of them, both of them are arthropod transmitted, which means that in order for the life cycle to continue, um, these parasites are usually are usually transmitted by the bite of the vector. So these species are similar and cannot be differentiated based on morphological grounds. Fortunately, we do not have trypanosoma in our country, but we have malaria. But that's of course another that's another um, topic for discussion. So um, let us discuss the stages of development of trypanosoma. So a while ago. A while ago, um, we discussed about we discussed about um, a mastigote and promastigote. So a mastigote means that it doesn't have flagellum yet, and then promastigote there's a single flagellum. Okay. So here for Trypanosoma, we have the so-called epimastigote and otherwise known as the cratidial stage, and then the tripomastigote otherwise known as the trypanosomal stage. So the epimastigote stage occurs in transmitting fly. So we usually call it the uh, uh, che fly. So you will, uh, I will be introducing to you che, -che fly later on. So it changes into metacystic trypanosome in the salivary gland. So take note, metacystic trypanosome is the infective stage of trypanosoma. Okay, for both Trypanosoma gambiense and Trypanosoma radosiense. Okay, so 15 microns in length with free flagellum and undulating membrane. And it also originates from anterior to that of the nucleus. Take note that epimastigote stage would already have undulating membrane. What is an undulating membrane? Morphologically speaking, Undulating membranes like the thickening at the side of the cell of the protozoa. So you will I will show it to you later on And then the one that is seen in humans we call it the Tripomastigote stage or the trypanosomal stage. So 15 to 20 microns Okay, with flagellum and undulating membrane This time it originates from posterior to that of the nucleus Okay So we have already discussed a mastigote here, and then we have the promastigote here. So this is now epimastigote. Okay, so epimastigote, so let's take a look. It says here, free flagellum that originates from anterior to the nucleus. Okay, from anterior to the nucleus. That's epimastigote. There is also undulating membrane here. So this is the undulating membrane. If you remember Trichomonas vaginalis, it also have undulating membrane. Okay? Now, going back to Trypomastigote, the, the description is that it has a very long flagellum, an undulating membrane that originates from posterior to the nucleus. So where is it? The kinetoplast is posterior, is, is at the posterior part of the nucleus. So this is the nucleus, this is the kinetoplast, and there's just a very small tiny structure beside the kinetoplast. We call it the blepharoplast. Okay, so the flagellum originates from the posterior of the nucleus. So from this point to here. 
So you'd notice that the undulating membrane in trypomastigote is much longer as compared to epimastigote. Okay, so what are the species? Okay, the species are the species are Trypanosoma gambiense and rhodesiense. So these two are intracellular parasites. An arthropod transmitted known as the vector is known as the triatoma or the reduvid not reduvil, I'm sorry again for the typo, that's reduvid bug. The infected stage is transmitted to man when the bug bites and defecates on the wound may beat its bite. Okay, so so, so the, the bag has to defecate on the wound. So you have a wound, just akala nung mga redubid bag, ah, CR, ang laki. So they defecate on your wound. And it will now develop into four developmental stages. Unfortunately, Trypanosoma gambiense and Rhodesiense can cross the placenta and may eventually cause prenatal disease. Now, Trypanosoma cruzi has a length between 16 to 20 microns. The posterior end, it is pointed. It is provided with an undulating membrane and free flagellum. So whenever you stain, Trypanosoma cruzi, characteristically, it will be C-shaped and sometimes U-shaped or S-shaped. See? The S-shaped Trypanosoma cruzi. And then, para namang sisinto. But anyway, this is Trypanosoma gambiense and then Trypanosoma rhodesiense. So let us um, let us now um, differentiate the, the this table will now differentiate the three major species of Trypanosoma. Let's take a look first at the vector. Trypas Trypanosoma gambiense. The vectors are Cheche fly, Glucina species such as the Glucina palpalis and Tychinoides. And for Trypanosoma rhodesiense, the the vectors are Glucina morsitans and Swinotorni. Okay. For tri for uh, Trypanosoma cruzi, um, the vectors are the Triatoma bugs and the red bead bugs, known as the kissing bug and the assassin bug. Trivia. The reason why we call it the kissing bug because they usually bite the here in front of you okay but if it's assassin bug you usually bite your name it's like you are being assassin okay so it's what that's why it's called assassin bug trypanosoma cruzi is an example of intracellular parasite so transmitted by triatoma and red dubid not red dubid, red dubid bug the infective stage is transmitted to human when the bug bites and defecates on the wound meat Okay, it has four development stage and may cause placenta disease. Okay, so um, I want to discuss the life cycle first. So what will happen here? Um, the triatomine bug will take a blood meal. Okay, um, it will pass metacyclic tripa tri Trypomastigote, so that is the infective stage. It will enter through your mucosal membrane, such as the conjunctiva, or it will, uh, it will bite you. And then, whenever there's a wound, it will defecate on the wound that it has previously bit. Okay. And then, in the feces of trypanosoma, or uh, rather of the triatomine bug. It will deposit, or it will deposit, or sorry, metacyclic trypomastigote will be deposited, and it will penetrate various cells at at bite wound site. Inside the cell, they will be transformed into a mastigote. So just like Leishmania, a mastigote will eventually multiply by means of binary fusion in cells of infected tissues. So. Amasigote, therefore, could be a diagnostic stage. Intracellular amasigote will transform it into tripomasigote. I'm sorry, 
um, trypomastic goat. Um, trypomastic goat is the diagnostic stage. I, I stand corrected, not the MS goat. So trypomastic goat, uh, the the specimen for diagnosis is usually blood. So you can you can prepare a blood smear. And then triatomin bag will take a blood meal of the of the person that was being infected. And from the mid gap of the triatomin bulb, it becomes epimastical. It will multiply into mid gap and becomes the metacyclic tripomastical. In the hind gap, hind gap, ibig sabihin, kumbaga sa digestive system natin, sa large intestine, pero we don't call it large intestine for, for insect, we call it hind gap. Kasi nga, it will be, ex it will exit the triatomin bulb by, okay? So first it will bite you, then it will defecate on the wound that it has bit that on the on the bite wound. <laughs> ano yun? Double jeopardy, kinagat ka na, tinaihan ka pa. So yun yun prepanisoma plus. Okay. So what will happen? There would be a primary lesion. So we call it the chagoma. Chagoma appears at the site of infection within few hours of bit. Characterized by slightly raised non purulent erythromatous plaque, which is been namumula. Okay, on the face, eyelid, cheeks, lip, or conjunctiva, but may occur on abdomen or limb. So the acute stage appears 7 to 14 days after infection. This is characterized by restlessness. And then, hindi ka na makatulo. That's why it is also called the African sleeping sickness. Okay? Malay, increasing exhaustion, chills, fever, bone, and muscle pain. Also, in the acute stage, trypanosomes may enter the conjunctiva of the eye and cause edema of the eyelid and conjunctiva called romanosine. So, yung romanosine, um, namamaga, namamaga yung, yung, ano, yung eyelid because of the edema. The chronic stage results from abnormal functioning of hollow organs, particularly the heart, esophagus, colon. And in chronic phase signs, which means a long-term infection, it may result to cardiomyopathy. So, the heart is affected, cardiospasa, mega esophagus, this is fatal and can lead to death. Okay? And the African sleeping sickness. So, the diagnosis would include identification of amasigo in local lesions at the bite site. So, syempre, hindi pa siya nag-transform into trichomasigo. Identification of the C-shaped trichomasigo in blood or in CSF. Xenodiagnosis. Identification of Fleischmann donoman bodies, so we call it the LD bodies, in heart and in post-mortem examination. Serodiagnosis, which I have already discussed in Fleischmann yet, is a type of antibody test. So, the clinical, first there would be the so-called trypanosome chunker. So, when we say chunker, this refers to ulceration, which means that there is a firm, tender, painful nodule at the site of the bite. Then, after that, there would be invasion of blood. So, we call it parasitemia. So, once blood has been invaded, it is characterized by remi uh, remitted fever, on and off fever, and headache. Then, there is what you call the invasion of lymph nodes or the winter bottom sign, which is characterized by the enlargement of the lymph nodes, okay, lymph adenopathy. Then, there would be invasion of the CNS. This is now the Carandel sign. So, once CNS has already been affected, there would be neurologic changes like, for example, mental dullness, severe headache, mental deterioration that can lead to coma and death okay hence the so-called sleeping sickness so chagoma chagoma is a primary lesion okay this is now the clinical manifestation of chagas disease okay not chaka ha? chagas disease caused by trypanosoma cruzi so then there would be what erythematous plate on the face, eyelids, cheeks, and lips. Namumula yung muka. Okay? And then, acute stage between 17, between 7 to 14 days, there would be restlessness, sleepless, malay, chills, fever, exhaustions, bone, and muscle pain. 
now Romanas sign is observed. Remember the Romano sign? In Romano sign, there would be um, edematous um, effusion of the eyelid. And then chronic stage, malfunctioning of the heart, esophagus, um, colon. This is fatal and may lead to coma. So, um, the African sleeping sickness pathology, again, uh, there would be, uh, I think this has already been um, discussed from the previous slide. Okay. And lag diagnosis. So, what are the specimens for diagnosis? At the early stage of the disease, um, you may, uh, a fluid from the where the bite has taken place um, can maybe aspirated. Okay. But if the disease is already, uh, if the person is already feverish or at the febrile stage of the disease, um, blood smear, okay, from the buffy coat. You know what a buffy coat is? When, if you will be centrifuging the blood, okay, so at the bottommost part, that would be the pock red blood cell. And then the whitish creamy layer between the plasma and the pock cell volume. You call that the buffy coat. So you get that buffy coat first and make a blood smear so that you'll be able to see trypomastigote. So trypomastigote is extracellular as compared to a mastigote, which is intracellular. So there are two types of blood film that you may that you can actually do. Okay, the thick and the thin. So thick means a uh, drop of blood. In the slide thin you use another slide as a spreader okay and then um, you may stain the smear with the may gimsa stain for example so it's an example of the Romanowski group of stain um, leaf node aspirate may also be done or CSF serological serological test so these are antibody tests okay so so that ends our blood, sorry, this is the things that I've discussed in part one. Most of these are, are tissue protozoans, okay, with the first exception of, of the tripon, trypanosoma, which uh, at, at, the, at, at some stage of their life has invaded the circulatory system. So see you on part two. Bye for now.